David Gilmour, one of the most iconic and probably one of the greatest players ever. You love him just as much as I do. But the question is today, what is it about David's playing that makes him so fucking good? I heard so much music in the 70s as a kid growing up because my mother and my aunt had the radio going all day long. Heard all the rock hits and the pop hits back then in the 70s. And another brick in the wall part two was the single uh, was played dozens and dozens and dozens of times. And that song, especially David's solo at the end, just reminds me of my childhood. I mean, that song, that solo is just a part of me. It is ingrained in me, to be sure. And I think David is part of this bygone era where shredding and showing off wasn't king. Emotion and expression was king when it came to guitar. So with that in mind, why don't we start off with another Brick in the Wall part two, that solo. What I think makes it so fucking cool is that David doesn't start on beat one of where his solo section is. A lot of us, I think, when we're beginning guitar players or good beginning music people, we always have our teacher or a metronome count us off for ticks or for uh, beats until we start playing. One, two, three four. And then we start playing. But David, he does this again and again. He loves to lead up into the solo. So before his solo section starts, he plays a beat or two beats beforehand. In this case, he plays on beat three and then the solo section comes in. So let me give you an example. I'm going to count to four. Well, I'm going to count off, but you're going to hear uh, on beat three, I'm going to sing the solo. Okay, so check it out. This is how David starts the solo. One, two. Da -da 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 -boom. Really awesome. You heard that I didn't count beat three or four because I was busy singing the solo. So he's leading into it with that lick. Let me play it for you. How cool, what a cool little lick. It's in D minor, and it is just a, really, it's just a blues lick. But that tonality combined with that groove and David's spectacular playing, it's just a really awesome way to lead up into your solo. And further, what makes David so good is crafting that sound of that solo if you ever get a chance, find online the history of how that particular solo was recorded. It was more than just David plugging into an amp and then putting a microphone in front of the speaker cabinet. It was a long, arduous process of uh, using a DI into the probably a Neve board and recording that and then reamping it adding tons of compression, probably doing some EQ and all sorts of um, processing. So it, you can tell, and when you read that article, it's clearly a labor of love. Uh, a lot of time was put into crafting that tone, and I think that's what adds to its uniqueness and part of why Gilmore is so awesome, willing to experiment and do so much building in order to deliver that kind of cool tone. Another thing that makes David so good is his use of double stops. Let's go back to another Brick in the Wall part two, and I'll play this part. Uh, you should know it real well. But these are double stops, and real quick, double stops are when you play two notes at the same time. So, for example, in uh, this solo, those two notes are played at the same time which sounds so cool because uh, typically when we solo, we think of just single notes. And of course, David does that. When he throws in these double stops, it's so fresh and exciting to the ear. It sounds cool and his great sense of rhythm. So let me play it, you'll, you'll get the idea. And the other thing is, notice that at the end of it, there's a little bend. Those That double stop goes up just like a quarter tone. Yeah, 
so awesome. What a great way to end it with that double stop and, and just a slight little bend. Really just adds to David's character and personality. Another one that you should check out is at the end of David Solo on Have a Cigar. Those, the way he's playing those double stops at the end, it's it's almost like he's playing funk. Such a cool sound. So check that out, more use of double stops. And you can look on all of his albums. There's use of double stops everywhere. Such a, such a great sound. Riffs. David writes such killer riffs. How about this in its simplicity? I mean, that is such a haunting chord. And you notice it's not a fancy fingering. It's really just a G minor chord with a major sixth added. So if you uh, know, a G minor seven chord will have the notes G, B flat, D, and F. And so when David plays this, this bottom note, there's your B flat. That next note he plays is the F. There's the G. And then this last note here is an E. That's the major six. And with all the effects and it's by itself, it is such a cool riff. And it is definitely iconic, I think, from Shine On You Crazy Diamond. I mean, if I listen to that song, when that part comes up, I'm like lost someplace else. Just something that simple with the effects, and he's probably, again, worked hard to craft a tone that is really unique in him. It's so fucking good. The song Fearless has this cool little octave riff. Like, the first time I heard it, that's it. It was a riff I will never forget. And again, it's the simplicity, because all it is is octaves, a la Wes Montgomery and a lot of uh, other jazz players. And what I mean by octave, if you don't know, is it for guitar terms, I'm gonna play that note, and I'm gonna play it an octave, I'm gonna also play an octave up. In this case, it's the note B. And at the same time, it's a cool sound, uh, having the two of them play at the same time. So David plays this little riff, and it goes something like this. Now I'm adding uh, the G chord because he's playing that underneath the G chord uh, while um, uh, the other parts of the band are playing. But these notes, they're all part of the G major scale. So when he goes up, these notes are, there's nothing fancy about it except it's part of G major. B, C, D, E, F sharp, G. Uh, but he does it in a great rhythm, great groove. I wouldn't say he does it in an unpredictable way, but it's in a way that is very unique and fun for him. He doesn't play it like this. Because that sounds like an exercise. You don't want it to sound like an exercise. You want it to sound cool and fun. And David does this with this riff. Just a great little groove to go with the notes really just ascending up the G major scale. Another thing that makes David so good is he's following the chords in the song. A lot of people, I think, that they feel David is so good because he's, it's only about David and he's just expressing himself. But the reality is that underneath, David still has to play the song. He's still listening to what the other band is doing. I mean, it's, it's obvious and he knows the chords underneath or else his solo doesn't sound good. So a big lesson for anybody when it comes to soloing is, 
You really have to listen to the band. It is not all about you as the soloist. It's going to rely a lot on the band in order for you to sound good. Thankfully, David has a great rhythm section. Uh, but let's look at, say, a, a solo here from Time. And there's, uh, and I wanted to highlight this chord change uh, in the solo because I was listening to it and it just this little bit, I was listening to it and said, oh my gosh, there it is. There is David explicitly following the chord change. He's, he, he know, he's really showing off the change from a F sharp minor chord to a D major chord. And the way he does it is, uh, it makes a lot of sense, but it just sounds so good. Because again, David is following the chords and most great guitar players out there do the same thing. They follow the chords and play their solos along with it. It's part of why they sound so damn good. So in time, in that song, Time, the part I'm referring to is an F sharp minor chord being played. And just so you know, the notes in an F sharp minor chord are uh, F sharp, A, and C sharp. After that, the next chord is a D chord. The notes in a D chord, D, F sharp, and A. Notice that there's some similarities there between the uh, chords. Some of the notes are repeating. But let's, let's get into this. So while the F sharp minor chord is being played, David plays this note. And he's really showing it off. That note is an F sharp, which is the root of an F sharp minor chord. Then he plays this note, which is an E, but an E is part of an F sharp minor seven chord. And even if you don't know that, it will work, even if you didn't know that. Then he plays the C sharp, but the C sharp is part of the F sharp minor chord. He slides off. The D major chord comes in, and this is what David plays to show it off. Essentially, a D major arpeggio. But David doesn't play the uh, arpeggio in one place on the neck, you know, the way we get taught as beginners when we learn arpeggios. We kind of learn arpeggios in one place. But that's no fun. David slides into that note, which is an F sharp, and then slides and plays a D major arpeggio. That makes sense. If a D major chord is gonna be played, why not play a D major arpeggio? It's gonna sound great. And of course, he slides up to this note B and then lands on the A. The B is part of the D major scale. So it fits in there really nicely. And David ends with the note with this note A, which as we already saw, A is part of the D major chord. It's just, just following the chords, it sounds so good. One more is Comfortably Numb. David is well known for this solo and it's so emotional. Well, what's going on underneath? Well. Part of it is David's articulation and his phrasing. Of course, that adds to that emotion. But it's not like David is lost and just focused on pure emotion and his articulation and expression. He's also making note choices that fit the chord changes going on underneath. So check it out. If you look at the chords for Comfortably Numb for his first solo, I should add, this is the first solo. And the chords are D to A, D to A, and then suddenly it goes to a C chord. David knows this. He knows those chords. So let's go ahead and look at how David approaches it. So when the D chord is being played, he starts with this note. Ah, but here's the uh, articulation. He does a rake. So 
So those two things make it sound so fucking good. He does this cool rake, and he's showing off this note which is F sharp. By now you should know F sharp is part of the D major chord. He plays that note, which ends up being a bend to the note E. That's when the A chord is coming in. He's showing off the chord change by bending up to E. is still playing while well, this note is playing, uh, which is an E. Yeah, part of the A major chord. Then he slides down to that note D, which is part of the D major chord because the D chord is now playing. And of course, he kind of repeats this. The D chord is playing. Here comes the A chord. Showing off the A chord. He plays this note that he didn't play before, which is a C sharp, part of A major. And now comes that C chord. What does David do? He slides up to this note. It's a G, which is part of the C chord, because the notes in a C chord are C, E, and G. Again, I just wanted to reiterate Part of what makes David so good is he follows the chords with his solo. It's part of what makes his solos so melodic and making you feel so good. He is fully aware of the chords going underneath. And, and just so you know, I many years ago, I was able to sit with another guitar great named Marty Friedman. And same thing. Marty said, hey guys, look, above all the shred and technique, you know, when you're soloing, you got to follow the chords. You got to know the chords and follow the chords. And it was just so amazing to hear someone at his caliber, like I'm, he's only a few feet away from me and he's telling a group of us guitar players, follow the chords. So you know what that means? If Marty's following the chords, you're following the chords. Go follow the chords. I'm gonna beat this into you guys if you become one of my students. Follow the chords. The 70s were such an interesting time because remember, you can buy the vinyl record, open it up, put the vinyl on. You could put on some headphones if you wanted to really get a cool experience. And while the music is playing, you'd look at the liner notes, you'd look at the sleeve inside, you'd look at the pictures and you'd really wonder, you know, about these guys, who they were, what you were listening to. Such a wonderful experience. And like I said, I'm sure you love Gilmore just like I love Gilmore. And I hope this was uh, entertaining and helpful for some of you to understand what makes David Gilmore just so fucking good. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the subscribe button and hit the notification bell so you can be notified the next time I put out a video. Thank you so much for joining me today on this wonderful journey and about finding uh, about why David is so good. And I will see you soon.